Welcome, everyone, to Creating a Family. Talk about foster, adoptive, and kinship care. I'm Dawn Davenport. I am the host of this show and the director of the nonprofit, creatingafamily.org. Today, we're going to be talking about raising a child with ADHD to a successful and healthy adulthood. We will be talking with Dr. Tamara Rozier. She has her doctorate in teaching and learning. She is the author of Your Brain's Not Broken, Strategies for Navigating Your Emotions in Life with ADHD, and she runs the ADHD Center of West Michigan, and she is the president of the ADHD Coaches Organization. I want to remind everybody that this show is part of our Back to School series. This is the third of the shows that we have done, so if you didn't listen to the show last week, which was on understanding and navigating that special education in the IEP and 504 process. And then the one before that, two weeks ago, was preparing your transracial adoptee for college. So make sure that you check those out as well. We've got lots of resources in the Back to School series that we are doing. You can find all of them at creatingafamily.org slash back to school. We've got shows, we've got tip sheets, we've got articles, blogs, we've got a lot of information there. It is evidence-based, trauma-informed, and it is terrific. Go to creatingafamily.org slash all one word, back to school. Thanks. Welcome, Dr. Rozier, to Creating a Family. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. A number of my children have been diagnosed with ADHD. So this is this is hitting pretty darn close to home. So <laughs> I am thankful to be talking with you. All right, just for our audience, we're going to organize this discussion today in four parts, and we will end with tips. We always try when relevant to end with tips for parents because that really kind of synthesizes all of the information into a way that parents can understand. So our four parts are going to be understanding ADHD, treating ADHD, and then some of the parenting challenges with raising a child with ADHD, and then looking for some of the positives with a diagnosis of ADHD. All right, so let's start part one, understanding ADHD. Let's let's begin there. What is ADHD? Yeah, well, you know, it's so interesting. ADHD is so misunderstood across our population. And so the first thing I would really want your listeners to understand is ADHD is a neurological difference, which means we process information differently. And if we keep it there, we really start to understand what ADHD is and is not. And so let me, I'm just going to nerd out just for a quick second for your listeners. I promise I won't go deep. Okay. But if your listeners tap their forehead right behind where they're tapping, that's called the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is the place where executive functions happen. I think Hollowell calls it like having a conductor. I call it having a butler in your head. In my book, I refer to having a butler. And this butler is nice and calm. And it says, Tamara, it's time to leave for work now. And I say, good job, butler. And I leave. And you guessed it, those of us with ADHD, we don't have that calm butler to think ahead, to plan. Instead, now if your listeners kind of tap around their ear, put their fingers around their ear, this is approximately where the limbic center is located. And the limbic center is very, very active in those of us with ADHD. And our overreactive limbic center, this is where fight, flight, or freeze comes in. And so you're going to see those of us with ADHD kind of acting out of fight or flight or freeze. It's interesting because my neurotypical daughter, the daughter without ADHD, is home from college this summer. And she's a delightful person and she works for the ADHD center. And there's times I'll go, oh! And I just startle. She's like, oh my gosh, what? I'm like, oh, I forgot to change the laundry. And see, she doesn't have ADHD, so she doesn't rely on her limbic system to tell her to change the laundry and startles. Instead, she's nice and calm. And her butler, who is working just fine, by the way, goes, "Uh, in about 10 minutes, I'll change the laundry. And so frequently, she's like, mom, I think you're overreacting. 
<laughs> well, I'm not overreacting. I'm behaving in a predictable manner consistent with my neurological condition. Mm-hmm. And so you're going to see children with ADHD have kind of a twitchy nervous system. And sometimes parents will go, well, my child is very inflexible. Yeah, because their nervous system gets flustered easily. Okay, I'm going to pause there. Okay, so I didn't nerd out too badly. But it's a neurological difference. And so for the parents who want to teach their kids executive functions, unless you're going to medicate, and we'll get to that discussion in a moment, we run low with executive function skills. And I really want parents to understand I'm an adult with ADHD. If you follow me around, even though I have a PhD and I run a business, blah, 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 my whole bio, if you follow me around, I look more like Lucille Ball than Dr. Rozier a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the symptoms of ADHD that are the most troublesome. You mentioned executive functions. Yeah. So you've mentioned some, but but are there others that parents should be on the lookout for? Yeah. So we, we put a lot of, you know, parents go, well, can you focus? And the, the problem of ADHD folks isn't that we can't focus. The problem is we focus on too many things at once. And what happens is I might be sitting in a classroom in third grade trying to listen to the teacher, but I'm hearing the lights buzz and, oh, there's a fly right by that window. That's very interesting too. And my seat kind of doesn't feel right on my bum and all this other information is coming in. That's what ADHD is. Mm -hmm. And so I try not to take a symptom approach because as we're going to talk about in a few minutes, Trauma and ADHD can look very similar. And so a lot of times the symptoms are very similar. Remember, there's two types of ADHD, actually three, because there's a combination. There's inattentive. And inattentive ADHD, you, your brain kind of goes away from reality for a second. It goes back and plays Lego by itself for a little bit. That's inattentive ADHD. And then we're very familiar with the hyperactive ADHD, because those are the naughty boys running around in preschool, right? Kind of preschool, "Ah!" middle school, high school. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And still into adulthood. So we're used to the hyperactive part, but there's also the inattentive. And then there's people like me who have combination. And that's also incredibly common in adults. So I do have the hyperactivity. I do want to expend my energy but I'm also very careless with details. And the hallmark I see with children with ADHD is short-term memory issues where they literally will forget. I can't tell you how many pairs of socks, gloves, jackets, you name it, and my kids lost them. And it wasn't because they're careless. It's an ADHD thing. Mm-hmm. We literally put something down. It's like we're lacking object permanence. It just disappears from us. So the children that, that we primarily work with are adoptive, foster, and, and children in kinship care. Are these kids more prone to ADHD? And then perhaps a, a subset of that question would be most of our kids have experienced trauma, not all, but right. many of our kids have experienced trauma. So how do we tell if our kids... Symptoms, behaviors, or ADHD are caused by the trauma that they've experienced. So let's start with our foster, adoptive, and kinship kids more prone to ADHD. So let's start with the kinship because ADHD is highly hereditary. If you have a father who has ADHD, that child has about 80% likelihood of having ADHD, him or herself, 80. So that's a lot. If you have a mother, it goes down to like 50%, 50 to 60. So because if it's a kinship, let's say that the child is with grandparents or an aunt, guess what? That family member may also have ADHD. In which case, let's look at this as good news. Somehow you've been managing life with ADHD. So you become that child's guide of, I have an ADHD brain too, and let's figure out how to work it together. Mm -hmm. In the case, and this is what I see frequently in my office, 
is I see adoptive parents who just love this kid so much. I'm thinking of one kid in particular. I got to tell you, this kid is such a gem. He's just a lovely, brilliant kid. Oh, wait, he has emotional dysregulation, which is a hallmark of ADHD. And he was adopted when he was three months. And so what the parents have been working through is, well, they don't have emotional dysregulation issues. They don't have short-term memory or working memory issues. They're looking at this beautiful child that they love with their life going, what do we do with this little guy? Right. Mm -hmm. And I've had the fortune of working with this person for seven years. He'll stop for a little bit, hit a growth spurt, come back. And I've, I've had the opportunity to watch him grow up. And something I've been working with the parents about is learning about ADHD. So the problem with this situation is sometimes well-meaning foster or adoptive parents want to fix the ADHD child. And I'm begging you not to fix it, but to try to help the child understand how his or her brain works. And in order to do that, you need to figure out how ADHD works. Mm -hmm. So how do we know if our child's behavior is, is different? How do we tease out trauma? Because trauma can mimic many of the symptoms. Absolutely. And the short answer is you don't. You let a professional do that. And even professionals will have a difficult time teasing it out. Mm -hmm. One of the easiest ways is if a stimulant works for your child, it's probably ADHD. Stimulants work, Tom Brown guesses, for about 80% of the ADHD population. So you have to medicate a child. I am saying, though, if stimulants do work, you have a good idea. And stimulants would not necessarily be effective for a child whose behaviors and symptoms are only caused only, by trauma. Yes. But you could also have an overlap between trauma and ADHD. Yeah. Well, this is the complication. Those of us with ADHD are more susceptible to trauma mm -hmm. because of how our brains function. Remember that prefrontal cortex? Those of you that have the prefrontal cortex working reliably, that's also protection from trauma. And so if you don't have that reliable part of your brain working fully and consistently, and your limbic system's constantly reacting, that nervous system finds trauma easier. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a very complicated thing. I always suggest we work with trauma first, then ADHD. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, always trauma first. Please don't try to help your child organize if they're working through trauma, right? Because they're still in fight or flight. And you're saying, let's organize your sock drawer. And they're like, we don't care about that sock drawer right now, right? And so, you know, it's the order of operations when it comes to parenting. You work with the trauma first. Here's a shout out to all of our parent trainers, our people who run support groups. We have got a resource for you. It is our interactive training and support curriculum for foster, adoptive, and kinship families. If you've ever struggled with getting people to attend your trainings or come to your support groups, or if you are in the doldrums of trying to find a topic or simply don't have the time to pull together a good quality, high quality training, this is what this curriculum is for. We have a library of 25 curriculum. Each curriculum comes with a video, a facilitator guide, a handout, additional resources, and if you need it, we also have a certificate of attendance. It is all there for you. It takes very little time to run a high quality group. You can find this resource at parentsupportgroups.org. That's where you can get all of this information. You can also go to the creatingafamily.org website, hover over the horizontal menu, the word training, and click on support group curriculum. Check it out. Okay, so let's move on to part two. You've alluded to it, treating ADHD. So let's yes. start by talking about early diagnosing and intervention. <laughs> let's talk about the importance of, of getting an early diagnosis. Yeah. So research has changed on this. I have three biological kids. Two of them have ADHD donated from me. 
the research back when they were young, they're in their late 20s now, was you just let them develop, you give them a good home life, you don't really need to medicate unless they're having problems. And so that's what I did. I would do it differently now. So here's what I would do differently. I would get them diagnosed early. Because now there's beginning evidence. Barkley recommends this. Russell Barkley, he recommends early diagnosis and treatment leads to better outcomes eventually. And remember, ADHD kids, we have a higher risk of mortality from the time we're born. We take more risk. We don't adequately judge the risk of an event. When they get to teenagers, promiscuous sex is always on the table, risky driving behaviors. So it's, it's actually, the research on this is ADHD folks tend to live 13 years less than their cohort, than their neurotypical cohort. And I say that shocking thing, because if you are a parent of an ADHD child, this is not just they're a dingbat and can't remember their homework from school. This is actually a risky thing to have. And treatment, early treatment, we find gives more blood flow to the prefrontal cortex. Remember that magic butler area? Research is showing that if we start to treat early, then they have more access to their prefrontal cortex. And when you say treat, I mean, the question that always comes up for parents is to medicate or not. So right. let's talk about that. Then I'll ask you about the different types of medications. But what does the current research show as far as you've mentioned, the efficacy was 80%, which is really kind of a startling statistic, isn't it? Right. Yeah. So. You know, there's still a stigma around treating, and I think it still is kind of there from the 1980s. In the 1980s, we weren't good at treating ADHD. And remember, I had children in the 90s, and so I was still kind of in that time frame thinking, I'm not going to medicate my kids, mm -hmm. have them be like zombies, like the kids I used to see in school, right? But that's not really true. We've come a long way, and that was, that was Ritalin. Ritalin was the first generation. And now we're on fourth and fifth generations. We're getting much better at treating ADHD. So it is very important that if you expect a child to get their homework from school, that you give them access to their prefrontal cortex to do that. In other words, if you want a certain behavior, then you have to allow them the equipment to do it. Mm -hmm. It would be like sitting a kid in class going, look at the board at the front of this class, and they can't see it. They're going, no, 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 I'm not going to give you glasses to do it. You learn to see it. Just learn to see it. If you tried hard enough, you would be able to see that If you tried hard yes. enough, oh yeah. my gosh, how many times have we damaged children, <laughs> including myself, by saying, well, if you just worked a little bit harder. And so I think we have to kind of get over this medication is evil. Stimulants do work. That is just the truth. We have time-release stimulants now. We have a stimulant that you could take at nighttime. And by we, you know, I'm not representing big pharma, but yeah. we as the ADHD folks, yeah. we have a stimulant you can take at nighttime. It sits in your stomach and you wake up medicated. My oldest stepdaughter is on it. And it's like she wakes up wearing glasses. Like the rest of us are kind of fumbling at Christmas morning. We're bumping into walls, fumbling to do things. She just wakes up. She's just normal. And so that's a great medication to be on. So we've come a long way in releasing it at appropriate doses so that we have the appropriate dopamine regulation throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And that is the great part. So there are different kinds of medications. The biggest group are stimulants. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but stimulants tend to be the low-hanging fruit that any doctor is going to go after first. I personally like the time release for children because the short acting gives too big of a boost and then it's like they drop off the cliff. And that's where you get the afternoon witch, witching hour. Mm -hmm. The kids crash and they come home from school from being good all day. Their medication's out of their system, and they're like, 
they're turned into these horrible creatures. And you're like, wow, I really miss my child right now. So I tend to like time release for that reason. Is it common that parents will need to do some experimenting, not that them, but with their doctor, obviously, that the, the first line, Adderall, are concerned that it's not effective and that they will need to experiment yeah. with different, or do most kids take the two that are the predominant? Yeah. So, you know, doctors usually will start with Adderall or Concerta. I tend not to like Adderall much. This is just personal, but if you want to cut a piece of bread, it's like using an axe. Sure, you cut the bread, but what have you done to the bread now? Like it's mangled. Uh-huh. Whereas Concerta, because the time release is more like a knife. Mm-hmm. And I say that because children are very sensitive to the release system. By the way, we're speaking like a parent who's been through this. I always explain to children and to parents that it's going to take a time to find the right medication and the right dose. And so for children who wear glasses, I always say, remember when you were at the eye doctor and he kept going, which one's better, this one or this one? You know, and you had to raise your hand like this side's better, this side's better. And if they don't wear glasses, you know, I use other metaphors, but Mm -hmm. it is an exercise in trial and error. And likely changes as the child ages as well, because their body size changes and their hormones and everything else is changing. Yeah, actually hormones. So ADHD meds aren't titrated to weight or size of the child, but hormones do affect how our medications work. And in fact, there's side note, there's a lot of research coming out about women in ADHD and how right before their menstrual cycles, their ADHD men simply aren't working, which is great news for females right as they're experiencing <laughs> the menstrual syndrome. Yeah, yeah. Bad planning. <laughs> yeah. But keep, keep that in mind for your female teenagers who have ADHD. Okay. And another question that we often will get is... The idea of a medication holiday, a medication break, that we won't do medication on the weekends or we'll take off the summer, that type of thing. What's the current research indicate about the wisdom of taking a break? Yeah, I understand the logic behind taking a break. You're trying to give the liver a break and kind of reset it. My clients who swear by their marijuana use will take tea breaks. For the same reason, right? Because they built up a tolerance, T T meaning THC. That is the same logic. The problem with this is the logic doesn't hold if you expect the child to manage their moods and to get something done. Because that prefrontal cortex tells us what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. So if you're going to have expectations for your child, to not have erratic moods and know what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, then medication is necessary. And I'm speaking to you as an adult who is medicated. And before I take meds, I'm just like, what do I do for a living? And when I take meds, I'm like, okay, so I'm going to do these next activities. Hmm. And if I'm an adult saying this, think how children's brains who aren't as metacognitive are feeling. So if parents expect certain behaviors from their child that look more neurotypical, then taking holidays is not good logic. Okay. I know you're listening to this podcast, but have you subscribed to this podcast or followed it depending on what platform you're listening to? We're on all the major platforms. It really helps us if you subscribe or follow to us. And it helps you because it gives you access to our extensive archive of shows, including a lot of shows on school issues, which is in keeping with the Back to School campaign. We've been doing this show for almost 16 years, heaven help us, and we have a huge archive, and most of it is evergreen material, just as relevant today as it was when we recorded it. So please follow or subscribe to the creatingafamily.org podcast. So now we're going to go into part three, which is really the heart of this, which is the parenting challenges and rewards, we should add, with raising a child with ADHD. So I think 
it always helps. We find just across the board that one of the problems in parenting is our expectations. If we go in with a certain expectation and that expectation is not met, then we're fighting our own issues, our own disappointment, our own surprises, as opposed to parenting the child that we have. So let's talk about the the idea of managing our expectations. Oh, I just love how you framed it. You're an experienced parent who talks to parents because it really is about expectations. If you have an ADHD kiddo, you're going to notice they're incredibly sensitive. And so one, one minute, they can be gigantic jerks to you and see the meanest thing possible right? And then later you'll see incredible remorse. And they'll be like, I am so sorry. I didn't mean that you weren't a good mom because they're just trying to be mean to you, right? In that moment. And you'll see that sensitivity and it's going to be confusing. Mm -hmm. So we first want to adjust our expectations around emotional management. I work with a lot of parents and they say, well, I'd like for him not to do this behavior. And I say, well, cool story, but that's an unrealistic expectation. The realistic expectation is helping them fix it once they've messed up because they're so young. Now, I'm pretty good at emotional management. I'm 55 years old. I should be, Mm -hmm. right? But your kiddos are still learning this vital skill. And remember, they're running three years behind their neurotypical counterparts. Is Is that for emotional development? It's mostly emotional. It could be social and it's definitely executive function, Mm -hmm. meaning organization. So if you have a 14 year old, they're going to organize their room like an 11 year old. Mm -hmm. And I hear parents all the time say, well, she's 14. She should be able to do this. Whoops. There's that expectation. Let's back it down to the more reasonable one of an 11 year old. And then parents will say, but She's so smart. Why can't she do this? Well, it's because she's smart, maybe like a 16-year-old. But emotionally or organizationally, executive function-wise, she's still more like an 11-year-old. Mm-hmm. And that's what the expectations are about, right? We always want to focus on seeing the child we have, like you said. Mm-hmm. And stop comparing our kids and ourselves, for that matter, to other parents. And it's tempting because you see other parents who say, okay, time to pick up. And their kids (laughs) pick up. And are their kids come home with the school assignment and actually are able to sit down and within a reasonable period of time, complete it, and then go out and have fun and do other things. And you're still sitting there inside feeling trapped. Because you can't leave, because if you leave, your Uh, child won't focus, and you can't help but compare yourself. Yes, that's exactly it. So, you know, it's funny. I I joke with the parents that I meet. I don't know why parenting books exist for neurotypical kids, because it's so easy. You say, go brush your teeth, and they go do it, (laughs) right? You Mm -hmm. say, go brush your teeth to an ADHD kid, and they hear, go feed your your little dragon in your room. And so you'll see them feeding crickets to their bearded dragon. And you're like, I asked you to brush your teeth, buddy. And they're like, oh, you did? And, and parents want to flip their lids because the kid is, is like clueless, right? Because mm-hmm. he was walking to brush his teeth and he saw the bearded dragon and he thought, oh, the bearded dragon needs to be fed. So then he went and did yeah. that. And while he was in there, he started playing <laughs> with the bearded dragon at the same time. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, you are a parent talking from experience. Mm-hmm. You are not a novice, my friend, because you're like, oh, I know this kid already. Yes. Or then you get into the kid who lies about brushing his teeth. Because ADHD people, I'm just going to tell you, for some reason, we don't like brushing our teeth. We think it's a waste of time. It's not interesting. Some of us have sensory issues. A lot of ADHD folks have sensory issues. I don't like it. So they'll actually go into the bathroom, run their toothbrush under the water and go, yep, I brushed my teeth. And so then the parent's like, let me smell your breath. And of course, the kid's breath stinks. They're like, you didn't brush your teeth. Hmm. And then the parent's like, Now you're lying to me about something so stupid. I can only think this is a character issue. Mm -hmm. And now it gets confusing. Is this this kid a a big fat liar? 
or has a sensory issue where he or she's avoiding. Mm -hmm. So in that case, I really recommend to parents, let's try to problem solve. And so in that case, I would say, all right, buddy, we have a problem. I say, go brush your teeth. You go run your toothbrush underwater and pretend you did. So how can we solve this problem? And any ADHD kid worth their salt will go, just stop asking me to brush my teeth. And you're like, well, I can't do that because I really like that you have teeth and we have to keep them. And we, we really like having fresh breath. And so there's a lot of reasons why we need this. So let's try to find another way. And a couple kids, you know, will kind of enter into that problem solving. Some will be reluctant, but if the parent can stay in the problem solving mind going, okay, the problem we have to solve here is how do we get your teeth brushed? I was coaching a parent and one parent came back and said, you know what the child did? He looked at me and said, you know, if you were standing next to me, I'd probably do it. And the parent's like, I don't want to stand next to him, but you know what? That's what it's going to take to get his teeth brushed. Mm -hmm. And it works. But mm -hmm. together they solve the problem. Instead of screaming, instead of yelling, instead of like, now you can't go to the park. You didn't brush your teeth. What we're saying is let's solve this together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another issue that parents, well, that people with ADHD struggle with, and as a result, their parents struggle with, and that is impulsivity, self-control. That is the example you said the child was going to brush his teeth, had every intention of brushing his teeth, but saw right. the bearded dragon. All of a sudden, he was off into a it just you know he impulsively went there. And some of the the physical issues you talked about, children taking risk, is also just impulsivity. You know, yeah. we we have heard that girls with ADHD are more likely, and, and boys are more likely to impregnate a girl. Girls are more likely to get pregnant. That's an impulsivity. Often there may be other issues, but it's oh often, strongly influenced by hormones. Yeah, well, hormones, but also just the not the stopping and saying, oh wait a minute. I'm not on birth control or wait a minute, he's right. not, he doesn't have a condom or whatever. So all the thinking, you know, the, the, the act before we think things that happen, our kids impulsively shouting out answers at school or, you know, punching the kid next to them or tickling, you know, or pu pulling, yep. doing something. A lot of those are just impulsivity issues, yes. but they can drive you up the wall. So yeah. that is, it's, it's definitely a parenting challenge. So what's a parent to do? Well, let me tell you, no one's going to like this answer. And I don't like this answer either. We really can't solve impulsivity in the brain until we medicate. So for parents who don't want to medicate their child, we can't solve for impulsivity. What we do then is we try to fix the problems they caused. But let me tell you, like you just brought up, the stakes are high, aren't they? Driving, sex, you name it. I mean, drinking, drugs, the stakes are high. And so just dealing with younger children, the problem is if you keep correcting their impulsivity, they don't have the prefrontal cortex to go, oh, hold up, because that's what our butler would do if it were online. But if their butler is offline, they don't have that impulsivity. I work with a lot of adults. Once their medication just stops working, they eat everything in the house. Impulsivity, right? And so adults still deal with this issue. We can't solve for impulsivity. And I know no one likes this answer. And I'm really sorry, folks. Please keep listening to the end. I swear I'm not crazy. But that's not the problem to solve for unless we do want to use medication. And again, I work with too many people across the lifespan. And I see how impulsivity affects people. What you can do, though, is teach children to be good problem solvers. Because what happens is when you say, okay, no. The impulsivity caused a problem. How are we going to fix it? And they have to work backwards. A lot of times that will help them change their thinking. So what I recommend is, let's say, <laughs> impulsivity causes me to break something. Okay, I was just moving around fast and I broke something. Instead of saying, all right, you broke something. Now I'm mad at you. Sit down and go, okay, here's how I see this. The impulsivity caused you to jump on the couch, and because of that, you broke the lamp. That's the problem. So what should have happened? Well, I shouldn't have jumped on the couch. That's the child answering. Yeah, you're right. So 
how are we going to fix the lamp now? Like, what are we going to do to fix this situation? We're not guilting the child. We're trying to get them to analyze the situation. Again, this isn't a fast thing. Mm -hmm. Also, addicting behaviors, that's another risk of impulsiveness, right? Mm -hmm. Like video gaming, screen time is highly addictive for ADHD folks. So we want to try to teach them to be problem solvers for the problems their behaviors create. And it, when you do that, you're giving them power over themselves. Mm -hmm. you, know, you bring up video games, but it could be other things such as, well, with one of mine, it was reading, reading a book. But, so, yeah. but she could <laughs> hyper-focus. Why can our children seem to be focusing for three hours on something they're interested in, and yet finishing a 10-minute uh, homework assignment could take five hours? And crying and kicking and screaming, yes. Right. And oftentimes you having to be present to kind of keep refocusing them, refocusing them. Right. So unfortunately, it's because we have a nervous system that is based on interest. So whatever captures our interest increases the dopamine in our prefrontal cortex. And we're like, cool, we can focus on this. Bill Dotson writes a lot about the interest-based nervous system. It is not a character issue. I hear a lot of parents like, well, he, he can focus, you know, eight hours on a game, but can't do this. Mm -hmm. If he wants to, he can focus. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So we need to be careful not to make it a judgment. This is a neurological difference. And I need to train my nervous system. And I think it's a lot easier to train with medication. I'm not pushing it. Oh. I have parents who don't choose to medicate. But we have to change ex expectations when we do, right? Which is fine. But hyperfixation, by the way, there's hyperfocus and hyperfixation. Hyperfocus is this magical flow period where you're like, la, and you're just getting into it. I'm working mm -hmm. on my next book right now. It's just beautiful when I can hit this. It's yeah. called flow state. Mm -hmm. Hyperfixation is when I know I've had to go to the bathroom for four hours, but I'm still playing this video game. That's a hyperfixation. It's like I can't draw away. There's nothing magical about it. It's like I'm chained to this. And mm -hmm. you'll see a lot of your kids being hyperfixated. Mm -hmm. Right, both. You know, we, we often say to parents, don't sweat the small stuff. How does that apply when it, there's so much small stuff that, can, that we're not doing? So how does that apply to parenting kids with ADHD? Oh. Well, first of all, you know, just... To your listeners, if you're parenting a kid with ADHD, Godspeed, my friend. I know that we are exhausting to raise. The neurotypical kids are easier. It's exhausting because ADHD folks, and I write about this a lot in my book, Your Brain's Not Broken, ADHD kids and adults, we're bad at the easy stuff. And so parents are just like, seriously, I laid it right on the counter for you to take and you forgot? <laughs> like, how does it, how is this not on purpose? How are you not stupid? I, I know your listeners wouldn't say that, but parents are really like baffled. Like, are you willfully doing this? And so when everything seems like small stuff, it does become the big stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really try to redirect parents. Think about creating the problem solver. Okay, this causes a problem. What are some ways we can solve it? And they're not going to be good problem solvers. They're just going to want to go, can we just forget this happened and I'll try harder? And you're like, no, kiddo, I believe you're trying as hard as you can. So let's work together to find a solution mm -hmm. that will work for you. And if that solution doesn't work, guess what? We'll keep trying. Mm -hmm. So the small stuff is what drives parents crazy. Because you told me about your experience. You know this to be true. I mean, how many pairs of mittens, right? Mm -hmm. Goodness. I just worked with a parents this morning who they're like, oh my goodness, Tamara, I'm so tired of finding our electronics in the toilet. Like, literally. Mm -hmm. Like, oops, dad, I dropped your phone while I was using the bathroom. Yeah. Or I have the phone in my back pocket and when I used the bathroom, it fell out. Yes, this is yeah. my third phone that I've done that to because I keep <laughs> forgetting not to put the phone in my back pocket. Right. Yeah. Oh, goodness. So, a solution to that might be stitching up uh, the back pockets could be a solution to that problem. Oh, I love that. See, yeah. that's, that's just genius. Yeah. But the thing is, don't do it to the child. Work with a child. Yeah. 
have him, him or her, we have to be careful not to just keep using the him pronoun mm -hmm. because females have ADHD. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Really at the same rate as males. Right. And we don't often, it's interesting, but that stereotypical ADHD, we think of as a hyperactive boy. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you, I'm glad you mentioned that. Hey guys, let me stop here. Did you know about our free courses that we offer? These are courses in our online education center. We're offering it to you for no charge, thanks to the support of the Jockey Bean Family Foundation. You can find these courses at bit.ly slash JBF support. Check it out and tell a friend. Okay, now I want to move to part four because I think that's looking for some of the positives of, of an ADHD. You know, ADHD, well, let me ask you this question. It seems to me that we as a society or in, and as the medical profession is moving to understand that ADHD is not a disorder as much as it is a trait. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I feel very strongly about this because ADHD is a neurological difference. Difference. However, I don't believe ADHD is a gift. There's a whole group of people that go, ADHD is a gift. It's my superpower. You know what? It might be a superpower on a different planet. But here on planet Earth, mm -hmm. in this year, guess what? It's not. Mm -hmm. Because our lives revolve around executive function. And we're not good at it. So let's get off the, it's a gift train. Because I've got to work harder to appear normal. Mm -hmm. And that's exhausting. All the kiddos who are going to school, they are just trying to look normal for most of the day. And they come home when they're exhausted. Mm -hmm. Now, the one strength that, and I write about this in my book, associated with ADHD is divergent thinking. Would divergent thinking include being able to think out of the box, coming up with new ideas? That uh, is things. divergent thinking. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So convergent thinking, though, is turning in your homework. Convergent thinking is most K-12 math. Convergent thinking are answering test questions. Essays are usually divergent, depending on how the teacher is teaching. So school is even set up to work on your convergent thinking. And so it's even frustrating because the gift we have isn't even being celebrated in most situations, mm -hmm. which is why I keep hitting the problem solver because that's divergent thinking. Hey, let's figure out ways to solve this. And the divergent thinker is like, yes, let's figure out the ways to solve this. And they can think of crazy ways to solve it. And you're like, okay, that's a good option. I don't think that's realistic for us right now. What's another option? Do you see you're kind of touching their divergent thinking? So mm -hmm. divergent thinking, and I talk about this a lot with my high school clients, you know, in college, your divergent thinking could just look genius to a professor, but your high school teachers, most of them just don't want to know it right now. Mm -hmm. Most of them are convergent thinkers who just want you to turn in your darn homework. Mm -hmm. They want you to follow suit and it's frustrating for you. And I know it. Let's figure out a way to get you through this convergent maze for you to get to college. And uh, by the way, these mm -hmm. are kids who have expressed that they want to go to college so that you can express your divergent thinking. Mm -hmm. I just had someone come back. He just finished his freshman year at the university and he came back. He goes, you were right. I look really smart because I'll answer a professor's question. And the professor's like, I didn't even teach that yet. It's because divergent thinkers put things together effortlessly. Everything's connected to a divergent thinker. Mm -hmm. And thinking in terms of in transitioning into adulthood, in what career is divergent thinking? And there are so many <laughs> that divergent thinking is really a benefit. Guys, I know you've heard me say it before, but this show would not happen without the support of our partners who are agencies and other organizations that believe in our mission. We are so indebted to these organizations. One such organization is Children's House International. They are a Hague accredited international adoption agency currently placing children from 14 countries. They work with families throughout the U.S. 
They also provide consulting for international surrogacy for those of you who would like to grow your family in that manner. All right, now let's move to the tips section, which is what I think a lot of people look forward to. Let's yeah. talk about some of the tips for raising a child with ADHD. Yeah. So let's go back to that prefrontal cortex where you tapped your head. And remember, that kid doesn't have great access to his or her prefrontal cortex. Even medicated, just because of developmental issues, it's not reliable. And let's just remember where you tapped around your ear, that's the limbic system. The limbic system needs to know that it's safe. And so the best thing you can do as your parent, as a parent of an ADHD child, is to constantly convey safety. You're safe with me. You can't make me not love you. I love you, sweetie. I love you, period. You won't lose me right now. Now, for foster parents, I know that you can create safety, that this is your harbor right now. You are safe in this harbor. And so the number one tip is convey safety, talk about safety. A lot of the children, especially parents who are fostering older children, those children may not have known safety. And let me tell you, their brain is set up for that. If you're fostering older children, they're going to fight you for that. They're going to go, you're not safe. No one has been safe. And you're just going to have to be steady and go, but you are. Mm -hmm. And I will ensure it. And do you hear the calmness? Because the ADHD brain, especially they'll do the fight, flight or appease, right? Freeze or appease. They'll kind of, this can't be true. The ADHD brain wants safety. Mm -hmm. So that's the number one tip. Now, parents are like, okay, but that's still not helping me get out of the house in the morning, <laughs> right? <laughs> but we can't, we can't miss that big thing. So something I do, especially with adoptive and foster children, is I set up predictability. And here's what this mm -hmm. looks like for ADHD people. I don't create the structure. I talk about the structure. So at dinner or right before bed, I say, all right, let's talk about the morning. Let's just walk through it together. First, you're going to do this. By the way, ADHD people tend to work well with buckets. In other words, if you want a child to put on clothing, their younger school age, put it all like in a basket and say, put everything on in this basket and turn it upside down, right? But we're going to rehearse it with the child. Okay, then you're going to come downstairs. What are we going to eat for breakfast? What are we going to eat? You know, and, and we just rehearse the entire thing. Again, I talk about this in my book, not as a parenting strategy, but as a coping strategy for those of us with ADHD. Rehearsal is so important. It doesn't happen in the prefrontal cortex. It happens right behind it in the DMN, which really works for those of us with ADHD. Mm -hmm. So rehearse everything. I used to still use rehearsal with my high schoolers. We'd be getting home late from a basketball game that one of the children played in. And we're like, all right, it's 830. What do we all have to do to get in bed on time? I'm going to start. And so I would do this. Like, first I have to do this. Then I have to do this. And I would walk through it. Then I'd go to the next oldest. Okay, how are you going to get into bed? And I, they'd rehearse it. And then the next one. And it's funny because the three-year-old at the time, I didn't ask her. And she'd say, what about me? What about me? And then she would rehearse it in her three-year-old. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was delightful. Mm -hmm. But she learned how to rehearse. So that is a key concept for ADHD folks. One of the things that we found very helpful, it, it ties into setting predictability, is following consistent routines. And I found that for me as a parent, that I had been a little more fly by the seat of my pants. And my kids with... ADHD, really, that did not work with. I needed to have routines and predictability. And the funny thing is that I found that I thrived under it as well. Exactly. But certainly, yeah. I think that my kids, so we going to bed, 
we did the same things in the same order. And yep. in the morning, same thing, same yep. order. And coming home from school, that was a little more of a, it actually was a challenge because it, we couldn't do the same things because exactly. yeah, there would be a different activity or I had to stop and run an errand or whatever. Yep. So that was a stressful time. Also, we were all you know, more tired. Yeah. So if we're going to do it, like, let's say the child comes home and you pick up the child, then you're like, okay, so normally we do this. We're going to vary this now. We're going to stop at the grocery store. Then I have to stop at the post office. And then you're going to get a snack. And then, well, actually, I'd always have a snack in the car when I picked up my kids because you don't want an ADHD hungry kid. They turn well, into little So that's another tip, which is, yeah. <laughs> and, and the snack should be focused on protein and not just carbohydrates. Absolutely. Protein and healthy fats. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're exactly right there. But you start rehearsing it. And you rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Because even in good structure, by the way, ADHD kids do thrive in structure, but they'll forget there is a structure. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're like, come on, kid, we've been doing this for three years. And they act like you just invented this. Mm -hmm. And so if you just keep going, okay, and this is the pattern, here is the pattern. You're going to tell the brain that even though there's no executive function kind of following this, you're going to go, yep, this is the pattern. I'm going to follow the flow. Mm -hmm. It also gives ADHD children a sense of, I know what's next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of ADHD kids will develop anxiety. And you see a lot of anxiety in children with ADHD. And this will help address that. Here's what's coming next. Mm -hmm. And and for younger children, a visual chart of routines is very helpful. Yeah, yeah. Some older kids would resent any form of, of written, but others... <laughs> exactly. But others don't. They, you know, a, a checklist. And then as they get older, having them create the checklist. Well, I even say create it with the child always. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with a that. A parent I just worked with this morning. It's summer. She has three kids at home. And they're all in grade school. Well, once the youngest is three. She's like, what do I do? I'm like, each morning, let's make up a schedule for each of the kids. And we have like color blocks that represent their schedule. And so, you know, you're going to say, all right, everyone needs to put this block in because this is when we're running to the store together. So this block's taken. When do you want to do chores? And, and we build it together mm -hmm. because especially adoptive in foster children, think about how little control, depending on their circumstances that they've had. And so when we can give the brain a sense of autonomy and control, you're feeding that brain in really good ways. Mm -hmm. And so going back to the problem solver, like, hey, how can we solve this together? Right? How can we build this together? And then they take pride in, I built this schedule. I built this checklist. Mm -hmm. And if they're old enough to play most video games, they're old enough to build their checklist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I mean, it's not like, especially with a very young child, it's not as if you're not there with them while right. they're doing it. So you can give pointers. And you can go, what's next? What's next on the list? And they go, oh, I'll look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're delighted. Yeah. <laughs> In many ways, it's much easier with the younger ones. I agree. <laughs> oh, much, much, much. Thank you so much, Dr. Tamara Rozier, for being with us today to talk about raising a child with ADHD. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate you just, you having this show. You know, I know that your listeners really count on you. So thank you for bringing your experience. <laughs> yes, hard-earned experience on this side. Hard-earned, sure. <laughs> yes. 